Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your busy schedules. I know it's uh, quite hard, especially if like us in St. Albans, the sun has finally come out today. Um, so this evening, we're going to be talking about breaking crime in pharmacies. We're joined by Jasmine, who is our head of advice and support, uh, Patrick Holloway, who is a superintendent at the City of London Police, and Valerie, who is um, the news editor at Chemist and Druggist. Can I ask, though, that we put um, any questions that, that you may have, if you can use the Q&A uh, box as opposed to the chat. The chat should be disabled. So please put any questions you have to Q&A, um, as well as raise your hand at the end of the presentation. Uh, any questions that we're not answer not able to answer this evening, we will get back to you on, so yeah, don't worry about that. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Jasmine. Thank you, Jasmine. Hi, thank you, uh, Ashley, and uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Preventing Crime in Pharmacies uh, webinar. Uh, and as Ashley has mentioned, we are really lucky this evening to be joined by uh, Superintendent Patrick Holdaway from the National Business Crime Center and by Valeria Fiore of the news editor at Chemist and Druggist. Um, we're gonna share some uh, information from the CND initially to highlight some of the research findings uh, about crime in pharmacies, uh, followed by um, information from uh, Superintendent Holdaway regarding how to deal with crime in pharmacies, um, manage situations, and um, also discuss some scenarios based on the queries that we received from our members um, through the advice and support services. So, um, Valeria, uh, if I may ask you to introduce yourself and present your findings. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Valeria. I'm the news editor at Chemist and Druggist. And uh, thank you very much for having us tonight. Um, uh, as Jasmine said, tonight we're going to present in the finding of CND's investigation into crimes in pharmacies. Um, uh, our reporter, Emily Sten, has done a stellar job at collecting the data. Unfortunately, unfortunately she cannot present it tonight, but I'll be happy to do so on her behalf. Um, so just to give you some uh, context, we've uh, sent freedom of information requests to all police forces between October 2021 and January 2022. Um, and uh, we actually heard back uh, from 35 police forces um, who provided data for um, 2019 and 2020. Uh, while 20, um, 32 sorry, uh, provided data for uh, 2021. Um, and we asked the police a series of questions that included um, the uh, information about the total number of crimes committed in uh, 2019, 2020, and 2021, the total number of assaults or violent crimes, and the different types of crimes that occurred. So uh, any detail that they could share, um, that could be a date, a time, weapons used, injuries or the products that, uh, they, that were targeted or stolen. And obviously the police forces use different crime management systems. Um, uh, and uh, that means that uh, uh, data is collected in different way. Um, in order to respond to CND's requests, some were um, uh, using words like chemist or pharmacy where, when entering data to, um, to respond to CND's request. Um, uh, we need to bear in mind that although we um, uh, send an email for requests uh, for this data to all police forces across the UK. Uh, we didn't hear back from uh, um, Scotland. Well, actually they said that they couldn't share the data um, because it uh, will exceed the cost of the freedom of information request. Um, next slide, please. So uh, on this slide, you can find some key findings. So our investigation has found that uh, in the three years uh, that we asked data for, so 2019, 2020, and 2021, there were at least 27,335 incidents of crimes that were reported to the police. And obviously these are only the ones that we know that have been reported. Um, and uh, according to uh, this data, we found that just in 2021, at least 1,437 reports of violent crimes uh, to were reported to the police. And uh, we basically classified violent crimes as um, those that include violence against the person or assault, which uh, might have resulted in injury or, or maybe not, um, public order offenses and arson and criminal damage as well. Um, and again, uh, one, uh, one other figure that uh, is really striking is that violent crime accounted for 17.9% of all crimes reported in uh, 2021. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here in the slide, you can find um, uh, some data about the most common crimes in uh, 2021 and also information about the different type of weapons that were used. Uh, oops, okay. <laughs> um, so during the time of uh, CND's investigation and uh, uh, the, the, the period that we were covering within our investigation, an array of weapons were, were used uh, against pharmacy teams. Um, and these include uh, knives and sharp or bladed instruments um, that were um, most frequently used in crimes in pharmacies. For instance, in the uh, Cambridge Chair Constabulary alone, um, there were seven incident incidents where um, knives were used over the three year period. Uh, but other weapons used against pharmacy teams or uh, premises included firearms, needles, or syringes. Uh, there were also um, a few unusual ones, including uh, uh, rocks and stones in 2021. Uh, as reported by police forces in Dorset and Northumbria, a screwdriver reported by the Lancashire, Lancashire Constabulary in the, in the same year. Um, but these objects weren't the only type of uh, weapons that uh, was kind of wielded against pharmacy teams. In fact, um, a few police forces also share reports of uh, physical force being used against teams. So we have uh, reports of headbutting, punching, spitting, uh, bent wrist and even bleeding. Um, and when obviously during the pandemic, we know that uh, there were like some pandemic themed um, it, it episodes of violence as well. So for instance, um, we have reports in 2020 um, of perpetrators um, coughing over with victims um, and also, um, you know, that resulting in victims feeling very upset, distressed or fearing immediate vi violence as well. Uh, on another incident, um, a customer punched a perspex screen, uh, which left the victim resulted uh, that she, she could have been punched uh, at the screen not being there. Next slide, please. Yeah, so on, on this slide, oops, sorry, here's <laughs> one, thank you. Um, on, on this slide, uh, you can basically um, see a graph that shows the hardest hit areas by, by crime. Um, we, we've, we, we analyzed the data that was provided to us for in 2019, 2020, and 2021, and we kind of uh, condensed that by area. And uh, um, a staggering 3,374 reports of crimes um, were recorded by the Metropolitan Police across the, uh, you know, the three years. Um, and obviously that's for crimes within Greater London and uh, another, the different police force at uh, the city uh, of London police force then um, oversees the crimes in, in, the, in the one mile. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so uh, there was quite a staggering number of reports in Greater London. And uh, um, for what concerns violent crime, there were 503 reports of, viol of violent crimes during that uh, period as well. Um, then we can see that uh, also in Humberside, um, the Humberside police categorized 1,791 reports, uh, and this went down to 1,574 in West Yorkshire. Um, a high number of reports were also recorded by the Police Service of Northern Ireland, which during that uh, three year period recorded uh, 1,505 reports of crimes. Um, and of those, 129 were uh, being recorded as violent crimes. Uh, and, and finally, in uh, Nottinghamshire Police recorded 1,284 um, uh, crimes, sorry, uh, between 2019 and 2021. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, as we said at the beginning of the presentation, we uh, did ask for um, the police of Scotland to provide some data as well, but uh, unfortunately they weren't able to share it. So here you can see a comparison between um, uh, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, so as previously covered during the presentation as well, we do categorize violent crime as um, uh, that involving violence against a person or assault, uh, which can be with or without injury. Um, and public order offences, arson and criminal damage. Uh, so on this slide, you can basically see the different percentages of violent crime uh, in each area. Next slide, please. Thank you. So that brings us to uh, the end of our presentation. Um, I just wanted to point out that we think that uh, it's not enough to just report on the data. We actually want people to take action. So we know that there is a five million pound for GP that allows them to install CCTV, uh, panic buttons, and uh, 
We know that Northern Ireland has actually done um, something similar. They, they are letting contractors to claim up to 5,000 to, to then expense any security measures. Uh, and we, we believe that it's time to, to get the same uh, level of funding to pharmacies in England, uh, Scotland, and, um, and uh, Northern Ireland, uh, uh, sorry, uh, and Wales. Uh, so we really appreciate it if you could sign our petition. Uh, we, we think that uh, we can make a difference collectively. Um, you can find it on the change.org website. And then obviously you can find all the findings of our investigation CND website. There is a dedicated, dedicated tab on, on our website under analysis where you can uh, find the results of our investigation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valeria. That's really helpful. And um, I'm just going to um, move over to the next uh, slide, which is going to be uh, introducing Sir Superintendent Holdaway to talk about um, some of the work that the police are doing in this space and give us some uh, advice. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen again. Um, there we go. Share. Uh, and hopefully you can see my screen. Thank you, Jasmine. Okay, yeah, thank that's, you. Uh, yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, Patrick Holdaway, uh, I'm a superintendent of the City of London Police, but I also lead the National Business Crime Centre. So you can go to the next slide, please. So um, we are, we're a small team, small team of four people. So myself, two colleagues from the Met Police and a colleague onto comment from the Security Industry Authority. Um, we work in central London. We can go to the next slide. I'll tell you a bit more about the role that we do. Um, so we are kind of where well, we are the, uh, the lead in terms of business crime for police forces. Uh, we, we work with all forces across the country. We've got points of contact in every police force. Um, and we've got there the kind of our three objectives uh, around improving partnership working um, and trying to raise national standards. So we, we work many police forces and kind of share their best practice um, and make sure they're doing what we want to do um, and make sure that they've got the information they need to do from that perspective. Uh, we're keen that uh, all crimes are reported because not only because it allows us to act with those crimes, but also that provides us that intelligence and we can then make decisions, make sure we've got the resources in the right place. But clearly priority for us is around prevention. So the more information we got, we can identify that best practice uh, such as this evening, I'll give you some guidance and advice that we're doing at the moment with other businesses um, that we can then share and obviously try and reduce the crimes that are taking place. Yeah, the next slide, please. So within, um, within the pharmacy, you're actually covered under the Assaults on Emergency Protection, Emergency Workers Offences Act. Um, so it talks about the bottom bit there is exactly who's covered. So there are people with NHS services. So it will be bound down to very, very much an individual case. So what I'm saying is, is if you do sadly are assaulted um, and somebody goes to court, make it very clear when you report the offence, when you give your statement, what kind of role you play, because uh, you may find that actually you're covered under the assaults and emergency workers. Um, and the sentence for those that found guilty has just been doubled to two years from a year. So it, it carries uh, quite a bit of weight in terms of that bit. Um, currently, that, that offence covers things like police officers and nurses, et cetera, but clearly the role that you play in supporting the NHS uh, is really quite important from that perspective. If you go to the next slide, um, and this is a bit of uh, legislation that's just recently come in. So the, the Police Crime Sentencing Courts Act uh, has only just recently received royal assent. Um, so this bit of legislation 156 uh, doesn't actually come live until probably the end of June. Um, but what it says here that even if, if even if you're not covered by the Emergency Workers Act, because you provide a service to the public, um, if, if an offence does go to court, the court must uh, treat it as an aggravating factor. So they will look at the sentencing and they make it an aggravating factor because you know, somebody's been assaulted to serve the public and they must state that in court. Um, and that does actually have a bearing on the sentence uh, in terms of that individual from that perspective. So, again, it's quite important. And it's a, it's a new bit of legislation that's going to come in that covers shop workers, retail, any retail workers, teachers, railway workers, bank workers, etc. covers quite a wide area from that perspective. Go to the next slide, please. So we just, um, this is uh, some screenshots of a website. We This is about to go live in the next few weeks. Uh, we're just updating it, but on there will be um, an awful lot of advice and guidance um, in relation to this. In fact, if you can go to the next slide, I'll probably be able to give you some screenshots of some work that we've been doing. So um, the, the, sadly, the issue of violence in the workplace is not new. We've been doing a lot of work with traditional uh, kind of retail supermarkets, shops, et cetera. Um, and with support, with support from uh, the Home Office, uh, we're just in the state of delivering some guidance. Now, 
Um, there's four videos being delivered by a company called Maybo, um, and there's some kind of screenshots on the left. Um, and those four videos are based around personal safety and de-escalation, saying no, reserving, refusing service, handling disruptive behavior and deterring and interacting with thieves. Uh, each of those videos um, will be about three to four minutes long. They'll be our web, on our website, they'll be free to access, but they provide that real tangible uh, guidance that um, colleagues will be able to watch and how to deal and explains how they should deal with some of these difficult people. Um, and the guidance has taken the company Mabo, uh, a large international company, do this kind of all over the world. Um, and we've, we've also played a part and added to some of that guidance as well. Now, the reason that those four videos are based, well, those videos are based upon those four areas is that we know that they are the main triggers for violence. Now, I know there will be a slight change in terms of the role you are within pharmacy, but I, I would argue that many of those around the shop theft uh, and dealing with difficult customers will be very similar. Do I do the next slide, please? So the, the other thing just to bring to your mind is obviously the shop kind branding. So um, again, many retailers were keen to do some work um, and raise the profile of, of uh, shop violence. So um, Association Convenience Stores uh, did a bit of work and they've developed this shop kind brand um, of which there are a number of materials and posters, et cetera, which are available on our website, which, which I'll share with the team that they could share with you. Um, and it, it's just a bit of branding. You can see a number of large companies are using it. I'll be really keen if we can get yourselves on it, get the MPA on it. Um, there's already things such as boots that already, already use it as well anyway, but it, it's just a way we're trying to get that branding out there um, and just try and share the message about trying to reduce violence in the workplace. Can you go to the next slide, please. There's, uh, we're just in the process of, with the new websites and designing some new guidance. So um, the first one is on the right hand side, reporting to police. Um, there's some guidance about when to phone trouble nine and when to phone 101. Uh, you won't be able to see it there, but we will share it when it's completed. But the police will ask, and what it is, is that when you phone police, um, the information you give them will determine what happens next. So if you don't give them much information, they, they can't, there isn't enough for them to make a decision. And the danger is that you might then not get a police response. So what we've listed there are just some of the issues that we would ask for you to, to mention to the police uh, call taker, um, because that will actually determine what kind of level of response they've got. Um, the other bit on the one on the left and the one in the middle is impact statements for business. So if, again, you've got a case that does go to court, um, as a business, you can do an impact statement, which allows you to kind of write a statement. And this is a statement that is read out by the, you know, the judge reads this and it's your way. There's two ways. There's one, a personal impact statement, where if you've been individually uh, impacted and one from a business perspective, which allows you to talk about the impact on the business. I, and that might be, you know, if there's a lot of violence, you're struggling to recruit staff, you have to close early, uh, it, it's certainly financial impact. And that's really kind of important. And that, and that really helps in terms of the judge when he makes a decision about what action he's going to take next. Um, and on the left hand side, we are putting together a series of guides. Uh, we did do a guide for pharmacies um, back in 2020 during COVID, because clearly uh, there was an increase of drugs that were stored on the premises, reduction in the number of uh, prescriptions, you know, increase the length of them. Uh, so we're going to just uh, we're in the process of just updating that guidance because it very much refers to COVID, and we're looking to just try and bring that up to date. So plenty of guidance and advice that we'll be developing, which we can help share. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this kind of last bit really it talks about um, the kind of things you consider yourself. And again, we're just in the middle of just designing this guidance, but it's so the, the picture on the right hand side, what we did there is this is this is from a police perspective. So we were finding a large number of police officers were being assaulted and it was causing some problems. Now, what we found is, is that the way that those assaults were being dealt with was inconsistent. So the police came up with what we call a seven point plan and it kind of set out very clearly the service that police officers can expect from the police when they are assaulted. So we're using some of that guidance there, adding it to a police perspective, adding it to a business perspective, and again, just providing some guidance and advice for, for uh, managers uh, and owners of businesses, just the kind of things, things that they consider when they're trying to deal with assaults on their staff. Um, and certainly what we've seen from some of the, some of the large retailers is that they do, they do quite a lot to support the staff, but they also look at each individual case um, and just learn from those lessons learned. What went right, what went wrong? Um, and sometimes they have found that where people got sorted is because they went outside of the guidance presented by the, uh, the retailer. For example, running after shoplifters, uh, trying to argue with, uh, with difficult people, following them out the store, et cetera. Often we're finding that there's some of the flashpoints that are causing some of those assaults. So that, that guidance there will, will kind of cover those, some of those parts. Uh, and I think the last next slide is the last slide. 
So there's my details there. Um, more than happy to contact us. We've got a LinkedIn page and a Twitter page. Uh, there's my email address as well as the contact at NBCC email address. More than happy to take any queries or any comments. But I know we're going to be covering some scenarios, which I'm happy to uh, support the team with. Brilliant. Thank you, Patrick. Um, that's really, really helpful. And before we move on to discuss some uh, specific scenarios um, where you can advise on how to manage and deal with the situation, um, we just had a couple of questions uh, that we wanted to ask uh, our audience, actually, uh, just to uh, gauge um, the experience that uh, our audience has had in, in this area within their own pharmacy businesses. So um, I hope you can see the poll on your uh, screens. Uh, and the first uh, thing we'd like to ask is within the last six months, have you or your staff been a target of crime in your pharmacy? Um, and that would be helpful to know. So give that about another 10 seconds. Wow. Um, quite a significant number, 92% of our audience are saying that they've experienced some form of crime in the pharmacy in the last six months. That is a sizable number, Patrick, would you say? Sorry. Yes, it, it is a number. And I think the figures, you know, the value we talked about earlier are, are really, um, there's, they're low figures. And I think there's a massive amount of underreporting. Um, uh, yeah. in, in fact, just to build on that, Jasmine, I, I gave an interview to the BBC last week uh, of doing a bit of an article around the sorts of violence in pharmacies um, yeah. and my point to them was we're really keen for more to be reported to police because the level of underreporting. and i think um to that point the guidance that you're developing about the process flow chart about how to report the post incident uh guidance that would be really really valuable and yeah. we'd be happy to mention it to the members once it's, it's ready uh, i think we had one more question please ashley uh, on the poll Thank you. Um, and we're just trying to gauge the frequency of how frequently have you or your staff experienced a crime in your pharmacy? So 92% of you have said yes, but it could be that it could be, have been multiple times, it could have been once. So I think that'd be quite useful to gauge. If you could please cast your responses now, that'd be really helpful. Yeah, Patrick, you're right, because some of the queries that we hear from members coming through, the, a lot of members particularly were mentioning um, being at the receiving end of quite aggressive and abusive behaviour, particularly um, when there were shortages of the lateral flow tests um, yes. and before the change about living with COVID came about. So, um, wow, interesting results again. Um, frequently is um, bringing in the highest number, almost two thirds, more than two thirds actually of our audience nobody's saying hardly ever so it seems to be quite a frequent occurrence from the look of things patrick does this surprise you at all no sadly not and i think um it, it's just to be aware obviously with the cost of living um are we going to see an yeah. increase in that because i think Again, people yes. are desperate for stuff um yeah. and i think the difficulty with a challenge particular challenge for pharmacies of course is you've got a number of patrol drugs so yes. if someone steals those drugs and they take them without any form of guidance or supervision, that yeah. in itself puts them in danger as well. So, you know, there's definitely an added element to it as well. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, I think there's one more question, Ashley. Um, we just wanted to gauge in terms of how confident would our audience be today before we discuss any scenarios and further guidance um, in dealing with crime within the pharmacy? Um, how to manage it, what to do, um, how to deal with the situation at the time, or even post-incident, um, you know, a process for it. So I think this would be quite interesting to see. Patrick, I'm also making a note of the, the four videos you mentioned, mm. which, you know, the short, sharp videos would be quite helpful. And also the shop kind um, information uh, and resources around that would be helpful as well. So absolutely, we'll be looking to present that. Wow, so the results are in, Patrick. And yeah. um, is that again? Yeah, it, it's, and some of it, it's, it is, and some of it's not to overthink it. it. 
the priority really is to look after yourself you and your customers make sure they're safe and then it's phone the police they're the experts um you know there's, i appreciate there's a couple of comments about it. you don't always get the service you require and i think that does very much come down to the information you're looking to give them um and what the expectation is so if you report shop theft but you don't know who the offender is and it took place and they've left police will not attend that incident simply for that reason alone you know they they need to attend for a reason there are only a finite number of resources so um they, they will make a decision when they do attend and when they, they can deal with that crime over the phone. So yeah. just to bear that in mind, really. Well, that's helpful. And I think part of that would be, um, you know, what you mentioned about exactly what to report to the police, you know, when reporting a crime. Um, and, and the right reporting uh, means that the police will have the right information to work with, essentially. Yes, definitely. And so things, for instance, you know, if it's a hate crime, you know, if someone's aiming comments around your sexuality or ethnicity, it's really important that you report that and make it very clear that it's a hate crime and what and what they were saying. Um, hate crimes, particularly, you know, treated very seriously by the police. There's quite a lot of guidance and governance around hate crime investigations. So, uh, from that perspective, but you know, we, we might pick some of this out when we go through some of those scenarios. Jasmine. Yeah, absolutely. So, right in that case, and thank you uh, for this as well. I think these are some of the scenarios that we have come across um, from our members as well, uh, from what we've heard. So if I can uh, just mention, so number one, um, you know, members have reported where a customer has entered the pharmacy and there's been a queue of uh, customers already waiting, but this one has just pushed past everybody, um, come up to the counter and loudly demanded their prescription. And there was already a queue um, where some of the customers asked them to politely wait their turn. Um, but the individual then started swearing and uh, calling some very rude names, including bordering on hate crime, essentially. Um, and the pharmacy staff member politely asked them uh, not to use such language, which further incited the individual who got very angry and started shouting and, and uh, threatening behavior. And then one of the pharmacy staff uh, well, uh, well, actually noticed uh, that the individual had a knife um, in their pocket or something that looked like a knife sticking out of their pocket. So question would be, how can pharmacy staff deal with something like this, protect themselves uh, and, and de-escalate the situation, essentially? Yeah, I, I think it's very difficult, Jasmine. If you're dealing with somebody with a knife, I think you just want to get them out of the store, don't you? I think you just want to keep them viable. But you know, make that as soon as you can phone the police, make it very clear that they've got a weapon on them, they've got a knife. That would that's one of those things that will definitely um, drive a, a police response from that perspective. Um, if someone's aggressive, you, you just you know, your priority is to look after yourself um, and look after your customers as, as much as you can, um, and then phone the police and let them deal with it from that perspective. In terms of de escalating it, I think it's just about being calm but firm from that perspective, ask them to stop doing what they're doing. Um, and this and this is where the value of things such as CCTV and body worn video come into play, because it gives you additional. You know, you can show this has been recorded. It's on CCTV, um, and, and we find particularly with body worn video and CCTV where you're capturing the sound um, that people do very much moderate their behaviour because now everything's been caught. Right, and 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 to be clear, when calling the police in this situation, they'll be dialing nine nine nine, which yes, is the emergency yes, number. Like it, yes. Yes, it's, it's, it's what we call a crime in action. So it's taken place there and then and you feel threatened. And, yeah. and the weapon adds a, a different context to it as well. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and then moving on to a different scenario, and this is uh, one which is of most frequently mentioned um, scenarios, is where pharmacy staff are regularly faced with antisocial, abusive, aggressive behaviour uh, by the same individual who, who may be a patient or may be coming in to collect medicine, but also um, shoplifts whenever they're in the pharmacy. Um, and, and the pharmacies, uh, pharmacy owner has uh, tried many times from, to stop them coming into the pharmacy and it hasn't been successful. So the question would be they want to ban this individual. Um, but how, what would they do? How should they deal with something like this scenario, which is a repeatedly occurring um, circumstance? So I think, so if, if you put it into a shop context, they just tell the person they're banned. And if they know their address, that they may write to them and follow it up. The, the, the complexity that you have from a pharmacy perspective is of course, they're being given prescriptions and they, um, they might want to come in. So, so the next stage I would argue is then kind of identify who's, you know, speak to the local doctors, um, 
or I know that a lot of pharmacies have got kind of community groups that cover a particular county area um, and work with them and speak to the other pharmacies and, and work with them. Because the priority, I suppose the priority will always be making sure that if that customer doesn't get the medication through you, where else can they get it? But yeah. that is not to say that you have to accept that abuse and violence. Um, definitely not. And I know from speaking to some you know, local pharmacies when I worked in Hampshire, they do ban people. Um, and they have to get their medication from somewhere else. And I think that's a right that you'll, you know, it's right for you to be able to invoke, really. And in terms of banning someone, is there a process? No, there isn't. It, it's no, it's your building. I mean, they, they don't have a right to enter their building. It's because you allow them to do it. So I think it's often easier if you confirm it in writing, if you've got their details to say you are no longer banned, only with a view. Um, that they can't tell me and say, well, nobody told me, you know, in terms of you've, you've kind of got that bit recorded. Um, but that in itself isn't, isn't mandatory. Sadly, you know, there are no additional, um, if they come in and commit offence and you've banned them, that doesn't make any difference from our perspective under law. It doesn't carry any weight. It, it's simply you just refusing their entry from a, from a private and personal perspective. So, so legally, it's not legally binding in terms of being enforceable by anyone, no, if, no. If it's, even if you've written to that individual. Yeah. Um, so is there a legal means whereby someone can be legally stopped from entering your premises? There are two ways. One is a civil route um, through the civil courts, but that can be very expensive, lots right. of money. Um, the other way is that if they are committing crimes, um, the police may look to what they call do a criminal behaviour order, which is they go to court um, and the police can demonstrate over a number of days or months or you know, regular offending uh, their, the, the, of their behaviour. They may seek a, a criminal behaviour order at court. And one of those conditions may be that they don't enter your premises. Now, if that is a condition, that is enforceable by law uh, and will lead to their arrest. Right. OK, so there are different um, options. Yeah. So I, I, I would, with all these scenarios, Jasmine, I think if you've got a regular offender is engaged with your local policing team. Right. Um, so if you can go to, uh, it's www.police.uk is the yep. main website, put in your postcode, it will tell you where the local policing team is, make contact with them and explain the situation and look for, to work with them to try and problem solve the scenario. Um, invariably, they will know the offender and do what they can to support you. Brilliant. That's really helpful. Thank you, Patrick. And I think um, uh, the other thing that uh, you mentioned controlled drugs earlier, uh, and sadly, we have heard this from some members where they've been burgled uh, overnight when the pharmacy is closed, where in one case, I think an entire CD cabinet had been removed from the premises completely. Um, and in other cases where, you know, it's been broken into and the controlled drugs have been stolen. Um, and so, you know, what would be some of your um, advice in terms of how pharmacies can particularly um, protect that element of the medicines so so i think there's two routes i think that the main route is obviously bear in mind you do have every force does have a controlled drug liaison officer um got the website which i know you've seen in your guidance jasmine so make use of them and get their guidance and advice but i mean the overriding principle needs to be you keep the least amount as you can kind of within the shop and rest of it kind of goes in the safe and i think this is some of the challenge at the start of covid we know that you are getting more drugs in Yes. Um, and of course, sometimes there were issues around storing those in a secure environment. And that's kind of what some of that guidance was about. But yeah, with it, with anything, with any retail unit, that the more you can secure, the better. But clearly, we know that you will be a target because those that will want the drugs. Yes. And, and uh, sadly, it's not only just uh, well, um, controlled drug thefts at night when the pharmacy is closed and broken into. In some cases, it's been in the daytime where yeah. literally they've been burgled at um you know, with a weapon at the point of a weapon to say, hand over the CDs, really. Yeah, and, and that that becomes a robbery. Um, yes. And it's a, it's a far more serious offence. Uh, it will be heard at Crown Court. Um, so, yeah, and it, but again, it's about trying to get that police response. So when you report that, explain exactly what's happened, how you feel, yeah. you know, the, the behaviour of the other person, because that will, that will make sure you get the right police resource. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you. So in terms of then um, the pharmacy team uh, being trained or being more aware of how to deal with scenarios of either patients, uh, you know, dealing with abusive or aggressive patients or uh, situations. Um, so we've had, uh, I think our members would be interested in how, what action they can take to provide some training to their pharmacy teams about how to handle such situations. So 
how would they access that locally um, and where can they access training from? It, it is well there, there will always be people that will provide a service and provide you that training um it, it's not for us to recommend that you know that's for you to for companies to go out and find the best option okay. um those four videos i alluded to will be ready in the next four weeks um, and they will be freely available on our website okay. um they're four videos i think together they come to about probably no more than about 18 to 20 minutes so sure. they're quite short and snappy very much to the point they give examples of what you should say what you shouldn't say um, and the reasons for that and i think you know they would be a really good start for, for many for many of your members just to get some ideas of what they should and what they shouldn't do um but, but failing that again <clears throat> speaking to your local policing team they're ready to give some guidance and advice if you've got any particular queries okay and um in terms of crime prevention measures that would be advisable for pharmacies to have in place uh, what are some of the measures that um are recommended but also ones which perhaps work the most or are most effective so we're finding so as i said earlier i think the use of body worn video and and cctv um, work really really well um, and, and make sure you've got signs up to say that you know you've got cctv in place um, if only just to kind of put people off and make them aware that when they come mm -hmm. in it's being recorded and their, their behavior is being monitored um, it's such a powerful message you know if something certainly does go to court that recording of that person's behavior um you know really comes out in court and it is often is far better than whatever you could ever write in a statement okay that's good and um i think um also we would want to mention that like a number, number of pharmacies um have panic panic buttons yes. installed yes. And when <clears throat> should they use that well i think you know the panic there are no rules around it i think it's very much down to the individual case of making sure you know why are they calling you know what I suppose you, you don't want to overuse them because of course it's kind of that crying wolf scenario isn't it but it, it's about making sure that your member staff feel safe so it's kind of having a bit of a and this is what the video talks about the videos with design have a bit of a plan if, if there's a problem is there a keyword so for instance we know that you, you got the ask uh, angela or the ask annie ask the funny, yes, the annie in terms of domestic abuse so we know that you're dealing with a real vulnerable element of society um, that they're their medication. Um, many of them will be regular customers that you feel very loyal to because actually you're providing real service to them. And we know that that's some of the reasons why people don't always report a crime because they don't want that person to get into trouble. Um, but equally, you can't just be there at work and, and accept abuse and, and violence all the time. You need, you need to put, you know, people need to be told they need to put a stop to it. And particularly when you're dealing with mental health, that can be a bit of a challenge. And that's right. I mean, I certainly remember many years ago. Um, working in the pharmacy, we, uh, the pharmacy team used to have a keyword, essentially, yes. that we were advised. Um, and, it, and it would change routinely every sort of month or every few weeks. Uh, but anyone who mentioned that keyword would alert the whole team that there is a problem here, that there is some form of danger um, and to do so. There was a process in place. And I think yeah. that is reassuring in a way um, within the team. But, well, I found it reassuring anyway. Um, but I think there will be other measures as well, quite rightly. So um, thank you, Patrick. I think this next scenario um, is a little bit of an um, ambiguous one in a way that um, we've heard a couple of times that a pharmacy owner and their staff have reported um, feeling unsafe for a reason, not because of the individual individuals within the pharmacy premises, um, but large number of individuals um, just hanging around loitering immediately outside the pharmacy premises front doors, uh, essentially where some, some of their customers have also reported not feeling comfortable coming into the pharmacy and they just walk past. Um, I mean, really nothing has happened inside the pharmacy, um, but the question is uh, what can they, if anything, can they do anything about that? Yeah, I think, again, I think it's about a case of phoning the police and explaining it. And I, th I think, you know, if I was in one of your members' situation, it's about explaining that the behaviour or the presence of those people outside are stopping people coming in to get their medication. So it's kind of what the impact is and the implications on your customers um, and how it makes them feel, particularly if you've got people, particularly if they have been a bit difficult and, and you, you kind of got to describe the behavior i mean if it's, it's a group of kids for instance and some people might feel nervous about that um you know you've got to take a pragmatic and a common common sense view but occasions you allow others that, that you know regular 
users of the pharmacy for different prescriptions and they might hang around outside and i can understand that might pay, make people feel a bit nervous um but it's a case about again about reporting it to police um and, and letting them make them aware it i can't underestimate the value of reporting so you know we, we talked about the figures we talk, reported earlier and i know that was only 33 forces out of 43 um but you know the data i've looked at you know there's eleven and a half thousand pharmacies across the country so even if you look at that data, you know, that's barely one incident a year per pharmacy, um, yet your short straw poll indicates that, you know, it's, it's far, far more than that. Yes. Of course, if you don't report it, policing can't attend to deal with any of those incidents. And I appreciate that we won't always turn up, but at least it's always recorded, it's always reported, and it builds a picture of offending behaviour up. And, and that's, I, I think it might be the key that, um, all the reports together, amalgamating together, can help build up a picture so that if, for example, one report may not necessarily result in a specific action against an individual, but if there's a pattern that can be established by putting all the different reports together, then it puts the police in a stronger position to take some action, perhaps? But particularly if you're going to deal with a particular individual, if you've already reported those offences, even if the police didn't turn up, they will be able to say that... John Smith has been causing these problems. And actually, here's a log of all those incidents that you reported. And of course, you, you can phone 101 or treble nine, but you can also, also report a crime online. So if you haven't got the time to phone up or you don't want to keep phoning people up, just record it, report it online. Just keep a record of it. Excellent. Now, thank you for that. Now, one of the other forms, um, I suppose, uh, of security uh, would be cyber security as well. Uh, it's not just physical crime, it's online crime as well. And, you know, it, it could be instances where the pharmacies, IT systems have been hacked into, you know, data breach, data theft. Um, what would be some of the key points that members mm. should be aware of in that respect? So there, there's quite a lot of guidance in relation to that, and I can circulate some real good uh, links to that. So the National Cybercrime Security Centre has some guidance, um, as does Action Fraud. Um, right. And Action Fraud have also got a business number, 24-7, which is exactly if there are any concerns around cyber security or to yeah. report incidents. So I'll, I'll share those with the team, Jasmine, and feel free to yeah. circulate them to, to your members. But it, that's almost a bit easier. There's a very clear process. Uh, it can be very controlled. Um, and there's some real good steps that people can follow in that regard. I think that would be very helpful um, because I think one of um, um, the plans that uh, Actions will be doing after this is once the videos are ready and, you know, some of the other, the post-incident process you mentioned and then, um, uh, you know, we can uh, do it as a package to make sure that our members have yeah. access to that information through our website. I think that would be quite helpful. Um, in terms of your experience in relation to crime within community pharmacy setting in particular, um, what general advice or any specific points that you would say would be the best things that other members can do to take action tomorrow morning let's say with regards so, to security of their staff premises. so I, I would reach out to your local neighborhood team so as i say you can access the details through police.uk um you will always have pcs and pcso's out and about just make contact with them say hello and bring them in offer them a cup of tea a cup of coffee if you're able to yeah. um and just talk about some of the challenges and some of the people you've got going around. I mean, it's when I was previously in Hampshire uh, Police, we did quite a lot of work in terms of trying to set up some process of sharing information. You know, you get a lot of people that come into your pharmacy that the police are interested in and there's information that you see. You've got a lot of guidance around safeguarding domestic yeah. abuse, um, which will please, you know, the police would be keen to support you on from that perspective. But the overriding bit is, is just make sure you report incidents. Yeah, and I think um, a couple of the um, comments, thank you, that have come through from our audience is um, that in their experience, they have called the police on many occasions, um, but they haven't uh, been to visit them. And also occasionally it's the issue has been that reporting, when reporting, um, they may be made to feel like they're wasting their time. So for example, if it's a shoplifting element, which is not involving large amounts of money, but even small amounts, um, so how can, um, how can they manage that and how to actually raise this? I, I know you mentioned, obviously, to get to know the local neighborhood crime prevention officers, um, but what else can our members do? So the, the issue of the shop theft under 250 pounds, yeah. um, 
whether it's from them or Durant, I'd be interested to know which police force that is. I've not heard that. Um, there are some police forces that will, that, that we, we know we did a big survey because this has come up before about a figure um, of under 200 pounds. And we asked all police forces, one force did say that they did put a value on it, but it was not where violence and abuse was present. Um, and actually even then it was only large, very large um, retailers, not in small independents. And, and actually it's not about the value of the item stolen, it's about the offender. Yeah. So if the offender's well known, but they're stealing 10, 15 pounds from you each time, you know, we want to know about that. They're what we call a prolific offender. Um, right. You've just got to keep reporting it. And I think the other option as well, if you really get unhappy, is also consider your police and crime commissioner. Many police and crime commissioners have now got business crime as part of their police and crime plan. So if you struggle with police response, make contact with your police and crime commissioner and explain that you're struggling um, and you're not much getting not much getting much support. Right. So when when people uh, report crime online through the police.co.uk website, what happens to that report? That goes to the relevant police force um, and they will look at it and make a decision about whether they're going to investigate it or not. The problem is if, if somebody's reporting a shop theft and they don't know who it is, we, we've got no CCTV image, um, we've got no name and address, we don't know who it is, uh, the police will file that. They will, they will do nothing further. They will take no further action because there's little that they can do which is why it's so important if you do have CCTV or an image of the offender, um, that's why that's important because it means they can progress the investigation. Right, so, and that's part of the security measures. You know, you were mentioning that the most yeah. effective it's a, is that body-worn video and CCTV. Really. It's about capturing as much evidence. Yeah. You know, and we talk about under-reporting and, we, you know, in England and Wales, there are about 260,000 shop thefts a year. We think the true figure is probably two or three million. So uh, we, again, a large level of under-reporting uh, and many of the reasons why we talked about here, but the policing minister, um, Kit Malthouse, is a big supporter of businesses. Um, and I was at an event yesterday, he's made it very clear again, he wants businesses to report crime. So until we get that data in and we see the extent of the problem, we're not gonna have the resources to be able to deal with it. So it's really important that people report the crimes. Right, and in terms of, you mentioned um, hate crime earlier, uh, about how specifically there's a specific reporting requirement with that. What happens when a hate crime is reported? W what happens to that report? It, it, still, it will still come down to the evidence of capturing the person. Do we know who it is? Clearly, you know, although we were police, you know, if it was a murder, they clearly put a lot more resources into it. But some offences, there's only so much we can do. We get a lot of crimes coming. We have to be pragmatic with what we can, can and what we can't investigate. So all the evidence around CCTV again and what's been captured, um, all, all ads and um, certainly with hate crime, if we know the offender, then action will be taken. Now, what action What action will be taken depending on that person and how old they are, the circumstances, what their previous history is with police? Right, thank you, Patrick. So um, just another scenario, we've talked at the moment um, so far about scenarios involving customers or you know people who are service users or using the pharmacy. Unfortunately, um, occasionally our members may experience a crime from within their pharmacy team. For example, you know, someone um, steals an amount of money um, or even medicines, um, you know, or, or they're suspected of doing that from within their own team. Um, how should they approach that? So again, they need to report it. So we believe that internal theft, again, is, is massively underreported. Um, if somebody's stealing controlled drugs, then I think that's really important that they need to report that because what are they doing those drugs? Are they selling it? Um, but in all cases, you report it to police. Now, we know that in many instances, the retailer or the business will just get rid of that member of staff. They will sack them. Um, the, the challenge is, of course, is that they then go and work for another retailer and they just start all over again. So we, we'd always ask that they be reported. Um, at least we then got their details. I, I won't guarantee that on every occasion we will take them to court. But theft by employee is a serious offence and it's one that CPS will take seriously as and when it goes to court. Right. And is there a system locally among the local police whereby, for example, if they're aware of any a spate of crimes involving controlled drugs theft, for example, or suddenly controlled drugs being um, you know, found being sold illegally or something, is that the type of information that they make local pharmacies aware of proactively? Yeah, um, if if would they inform pharmacies? Is that yes, I see um, intel coming back. At, so pharmacies are more aware that this is happening in their area. 
Yeah, and, and certainly that's the work we did in Hampshire. We were very keen that if pharmacies are aware of that information that they do report it. Um, I would argue in many cases, your, your control drug liaison officer is a really good point of, of contact uh, and make them aware because you've got a named contact. That on, that, on the website, you've got a named contact for each and every force. Uh, yep. Contact them and get their advice um, as the best way. Some forces have a slightly different system in terms of submitting intelligence, but, but I'd use those control drug liaison officers in the first instance. Brilliant. No, that's really um, helpful, Patrick. So you mentioned that some of the actions people can take and what I just wanted to highlight um, quickly next um, is some of the information resources that uh, we already have on, on the NPA website uh, that members can uh, access automatically and download and have a look at. So some of the police advice and the telephone numbers and who to contact locally for CD incidents. There's a police advice for pharmacies uh, leaflet. Um, there's also a booklet covering uh, different uh, types of uh, security measures they can take and, and advice for pharmacists during COVID, uh, which is on the stay safe point, uh, which is available through this website, um, through the NPA website. Now, uh, we also uh, wanted to highlight that NPA insurance, the insurance arm of the NPA businesses, uh, has also recently announced the launch of a cybersecurity product, which is accessible for NPA members. And further details can be found from insurance service at npa.co.uk by contacting them. And um, we've also spoken recently with one of our members about um, pharmacy safety and security um, to you know, seek uh, advice about, it's a case study about you know, what their experience has been and what actions they've taken to improve pharmacy safety and security, which is um, again, a case study you may, um, our members may want to look through the NPA website. So, the leaflet or the booklet I mentioned a little while ago actually covers all of these points. It's a, it's a seven page booklet at the moment, uh, which covers, you know, well-being of staff, security, alarm CCTV, looking out for entrance points, how to communicate, um, and all of these. And, and these are all, uh, I believe, would be a good summary, Patrick, in a way, building on the points and, you know, some of the specific action points that you mentioned this evening. Um, you know, especially about daily supervision of drug taking. So if, for example, if the pharmacy is providing a supervised a supervision of uh, methadone service, for example, or specific security uh, measures they can put in place, um, as well as dealing with deliveries and, and uh, securing the premises by design, really. Um, so um, that would be quite helpful, Patrick, I would imagine. Um, yes, definitely. Yeah. And um... And again, but again, if there are any gaps on there or something yes. we need to improve, please do let us know and we'll, we'll have a look at it. Absolutely. And this is what Stay Safe actually stands for. It stands for um, taking action within the pharmacy premises uh, regarding staff training, support communication, making a note of the incident, etc. And this is again available from the NPA website. Um, just wanted to also highlight uh, the different uh, types of reporting and who to contact that Patrick has mentioned. Um, and there are some generic general contact numbers here about CD incidents uh, and your local police control drugs liaison officer details can be found uh, through the website, the apcdlo.org. Uh, there's also an NHS online reporting tool for CD incidents um, uh, and also crime stoppers, uh, as well as prescription fraud, which is action fraud, um, which I think you mentioned earlier uh, as well, Patrick. So that, that is also available through the website. And uh, Patrick, would you uh, want to just mention this again? I know you, you talked about the two numbers, 999 and 101 earlier, just the difference between um, which number to call, like in terms of an active crime versus general report, um, you know, when a crime is not in progress, et cetera. So certainly, so when a call comes, so the, the treble nine is that a crime, a crime actually taking place right in front of you or from someone is in immediate danger. Is that very serious type incident, anything else? to go through one and 101. Absolutely. And that's the reporting <laughs> online on www.police.uk yes. as well. Yeah. So yeah. all of this information is in that police advice for pharmacies um, flyer, which is on the NPA website as well. And um, so these are the three uh, um, resources we mentioned at the moment. Once the other resources are available from the National Business Crime Centre, Patrick, Yes. We will add them uh, to this uh, and then help uh, our members with that. So in that respect, any final words of advice, Patrick? No, I think, I think there's something there. We're, Jasmine, we're always keen. If there's, if there's bits of guidance and advice that is missing, please let us know and we'll factor that into the work that we do. 
Brilliant. So um, in that case, um, thank you very, very much to Quentin and Holdaway. I think that's been really helpful discussing, especially some of the scenarios which our members are reporting, the experiencing and the information advice you've shared. I think the key takeaway message um, I, I'm distilling out is that when reporting a crime, uh, capture as much detail as possible. Uh, if you've got CCTV, provide an image or any uh, recording of the conversation that took place or the behavior of the uh, person who is uh, being threatening or abusive or aggressive. Provide a uh, description of the individual, even if no CCTV is present. Um, you know, height, looks, description of clothing, perhaps, etc. Anything that can help the police as well. Uh, basically, as much detail as possible, if it's captured, the more detail there is, the, the better the report will be, ultimately, at the end of the day. Um, as, as an action point, maybe uh, review the found security uh, as soon as possible. Uh, use the resources we currently already have to identify any gaps in measures and perhaps see how to take action uh, about that. But I think one of the other things that really stood out this evening is perhaps a scale of underreporting. Clearly, a lot of crime is taking place, uh, and we uh, would urge you to uh, report uh, Ultimate and Valeria. Thank you very much for sharing the findings from chemist and druggist as well. That was also quite illuminating. Um, Ashley, we had one final question to poll our members, um, uh, audience on tonight, if possible. Would that be okay to run? Yes. Yeah. Please. Um, and Running it now. Thank you, Ashley. So following all the information that Superintendent Holdover has provided this evening. Um, we're hoping that you found it informative um, and um, hopefully have more confidence in uh, dealing with the pharmacy, but it'd be good to um, uh, gauge um, where we are with this. So just give it a quick 10 seconds. Valeria, did you want to come in in the meantime? And um, was there any top information tips that you wanted to give as well? Um, um, well, thank, thank you very much again for having us. I, um, yeah, again, I just wanted to um, ask all if, if they could uh, spare a few uh, minutes to uh, sign our petition. We feel that it's really important to uh, put some pressure on the commissioning boards just to make sure that uh, actually pharmacies have the money to invest into the security measures. We, we feel that that's what's important at the moment. And uh, yeah, we, we do agree with uh, some of the things that have been uh, flagged in, in the question charts. Um, some, some of the readers we've uh, chatted with, they, they feel somewhat um, disheartened with the response that they have from, from the yeah. police. But um, we know that uh, uh, Patrick and the team are, are doing an amazing job. So um, keep reporting those crimes. Please. Absolutely. And I also wanted to extend my thanks. Um, and before we do that, Patrick, let me just um, see, you can see the results of the poll. Um, there is an increase in confidence level among our audience, hopefully. Um, and obviously we'll be making the resources available uh, as well, more of them in the next few weeks as they become available. Um, just wanted to add my um, very, very big thank you, um, uh, Superintendent Holdaway and, and Valeria for your time this evening to come and share the results of the CND findings and all the information you've shared with us today, um, Patrick. So thank you very much. And um, those of you who joined us this evening, thank you for your time as well. Hopefully you found this uh, really helpful and hopefully you'll join us soon on uh, other future webinars and have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.